Now, when you have social anxiety like me and you try to walk in public places, your brain sometimes forgets how your legs work and you stumble around like an idiot. The same is not the case for our player. He will always do exactly what we tell him to do, so let's tell him what to do by writing some movement code. For this we open our player movement script and if you forgot how to open this, just click on player and double click here on the player movement script in the player movement component in the inspector. We want to change the velocity of our rigid body in multiple different places. By doing it like this is actually not very efficient because we make this get component call again and again and every time we do this Unity has to go ahead and search the component in this object. Doing it one time doesn't matter at all, but doing it over and over again can really get expensive, which means that it lowers the performance of our game. Instead, what we want to do is we want to search this component one time, save it somewhere, and then just reuse it whenever we want to change the velocity or something else. And we already know that we can execute code one time when our game starts in the start method here. So this seems like a good place to search for our rigid body. And to store it, we create a variable. And we put it here at the top of our class below the first opening curly brace. We write rigid body 2 d which is the type of this variable. So what type of data we want to store in there. We want to store our rigid body in there. And we give it the variable a name. You can give it any name you want. I'm gonna call it rb, short for rigid body. A variable is like a box where you can put a value in and then you can use this variable to make calculations with it, to change the value in it, to reuse the same value in different places. You probably already know variables from math class in school and we can put all kinds of data into these variables. We could also create a variable for our box collider for example when we later need it. Besides these types, rigid body, box collider and so on, it's also important to know the basic types that we will use over and over again throughout our scripts. Whenever we want to store a whole number in a variable, we create an int. And this is lowercase because these basic types start with lowercase, whereas these more complex types like our rigid body have the uppercase name. So whenever we want to store a whole number, and in this case whole number is just a variable name, you can again give this any name you want, then we declare it as an int, which can have value, for example, 16, right? And the variable name should be written in camel case, where the very first letter is lowercase, but each new word starts with an uppercase letter. For decimal numbers with a floating point, we have float. So in here we can store a number like 4.56. And when we want to use a floating point number, we have to add this f here behind it to indicate that this is a floating point literal. Now we don't always have to add this, but in some places it's necessary, like here, otherwise there is some ambiguity in the compiler. It's useful to just add it every time you use a floating point number. For example here, our vector actually works with floats. So here it works if we just pass the 14 directly but it's actually better to pass 14f just to be explicit. The other two basic types that we will use often in our scripts are strings, which are basically just text and we create a string like this with um, these quotation marks as we also did in here because get key down expects a string argument. And we can use this to print some text on the screen or in our debug console, for example, like we did earlier. And the other one is a boolean, which we declare with bool. And this can be either true or false. We can use this to check for certain conditions and execute code in response to it. For example, get key down returns a boolean. If this key is pressed, it returns true, otherwise it returns false. And then we use this in our if statement to execute something in reaction to it. This piece of code will only be executed if the boolean we get back from this method is true. Otherwise this part here will be skipped. Now there are more basic types like doubles, but those are the ones we will use frequently. So let's just ignore the other ones for now. 
but we don't need them here, so I'm gonna reverse this. And one more thing we wanna add is, in front of rigid body, we wanna write private to make this variable private. This means that only this script can access this variable and make changes to it, not other scripts. And it's good practice to uh, don't expose any variables that are not meant to be used by other scripts because this makes it easier to introduce bugs in your code. You should only expose the parts that are actually be meant to be changed or accessed by other pieces of code. But it's not so important that you understand this right array. Just follow along, make this one private, and we also make our methods private here because we also don't want to access them from somewhere else. They are only useful inside the script, at least in this case. But right now our rigid body variable is empty. It doesn't contain anything yet. It's null. And we want to assign it in start. So we execute this one time when the game starts and then we can reuse this variable. So we assign rb with the equal sign to exactly what we did down here. So we can actually cut this out, put it here and add a semicolon. And then down here we can just use our rb variable. And this is now more efficient because we don't execute get component over and over again. The next thing we want to change is how we detect key presses because right now we have hard coded jump to the space key, which is fine, but there's actually a better input system in unit here with a better way to handle this. So when we go back into our unity editor and go to edit and project settings, we have this input manager tab here, which we can expand by clicking on access. Let's make this a bit bigger. And here we have different buttons for different functionalities. For example, jump. Now the benefit of using one of those instead of hard coding the space key is that it makes it possible to add the same movement, the same behavior to different keys. For example, moving left and right later will be possible by either pressing the left and right keys on our keyboard or A and D, which is very common in games. And of course you can change this in here. And this way you make your controls more flexible because you can add different buttons to it. You can make changes to it and so on. It's better than hard coding the specific key. So let's go back into the code and change get key down. Instead of calling get key down, we want to call get button down, which is the equivalent, but it uses Unity's input system here. And this is the name of the jump button, jump with a capital J, and you can change everything in here. You can give it a different name if you want, can uh, add different keys to it and so on. Back in our C sharp code, we replace space for jump. And again, it's very important that you uh, start with a capital J, otherwise it will not detect it. Let's run our game again and see if this still works. And we can still jump. Okay. And for moving left and right, we use this horizontal axis here, which is called horizontal. And as I already explained, by default, it supports the left and right arrow keys and A and D, and it has some settings here. So back in our C sharp code, above our jump code. We can also put it below. It doesn't really matter, but I like to put it above. And this works a bit differently because we don't get button down left, button down right. Instead, we get the value of the axis, which is be between minus one and plus one, which makes sense if you think about it, because we could, for example, use a joystick where we are not either all the way to the left or all the way to the right, but we have a gradient in between. So what we do is we create a float because it's a decimal number. We give the variable a name. I'm going to call it DIRX for direction X in the X axis. And then we assign input dot get axis. And in parentheses, we pass the name of the axis, which again is called horizontal as we saw in the editor. So now when we press left, this will be set to minus one. When we press right, it will be set to plus one. And if we have something like a joystick, it can have 
values in between, like 0 0.5, for example. Now, what we could do now is we could check if dirx is greater than 0, then we know that we move right. And if it's smaller than 0, then we know that we move left. And then just add the corresponding velocity to the x-axis, right? But then we don't have this joystick support when we, where we can move only a little bit. And I think it's nice to keep this in. And it also makes for shorter code because instead of the if block, we write it the following way. We write rb.velocity, just like when we want to jump, and we assign it to a new vector. As I already said, we will never move in the z direction. So instead of vector 3, we can actually use vector 2. Then we only have this, uh, the x and the y axis, right? The horizontal and the vertical direction. And we can do the same down here. We can change this to vector 2 and remove the last value. This is enough for a 2D game. Vector 3 is more important in 3D games. And then we want to move horizontally with a certain speed. So our jump force was 14F. Let's say our horizontal force is 7F. But you can play around with this. But we also want to multiply this with dirx, like this. Because now, if dirx is a negative value, then the x velocity in this vector will also be set to a negative value, and we will move left. And this is more concise than writing if dirx is greater than 0, move to right, else if dirx is less than zero move left instead we just multiply it then we just have this one line if you can't wrap your head around it just leave it aside for a moment think about it later and you will eventually understand the purpose of this and when we do it like this we also have this joystick support because let's say the dirx is minus 0.5 instead of minus one then we will only move by 3.5 in the x velocity because we will multiply the 7f by the dirx which is minus 0.5 and we move slower if this is confusing to you don't worry it won't get much more confusing than this the movement code is actually the most complicated stuff in this tutorial i would say so don't worry about this and for the y velocity value we don't want to pass zero because think about it let's say we jump up we add 14 to the y velocity, so we have this force upwards. But then in the next frame and update, when we click left or right, we suddenly set it back to zero. Then we would start jumping. Instead, we want to keep the old value. So we take our rigid body, write dot velocity dot y. So this is the value of the y velocity this rigid body already had the frame before. This way we keep it. And we actually do the same down here. Instead of zero, we pass rb.velocity.x. So let's save the script, go back into uh, our editor, close these settings, and then try it out. So now you can use a and d or the arrow keys to move left and right, and we can jump. Of course, we don't have animations yet because we haven't set this up yet, but this is already very cool. And it's already a lot of fun. Whee, whee. Okay. Back to business. One thing you will notice is that when you uh, release the right or left key, it slides for a little bit. Uh, it's personal preference if you like this or not. I think it's more appropriate in 3D games, which are more realistic in terms of physics. But in a 2D game, we basically want it to uh, stop immediately when we release the button. For this, we go back into our script. And we change get access to get access raw. The normal get access method doesn't go back to zero as soon as we release the horizontal keys. Instead, it does it gradually. With get access raw, we get back to zero immediately. And when we multiply zero with seven, we get zero. So we get zero in the x velocity and we stand still. Let's try it out again. But you actually have to try it out yourself, otherwise you won't notice a difference because you can't see me pressing the keys. But it feels much different now. And I think it's more appropriate for a 2D game. Okay. One more thing I want to explain here is the difference between a variable that we create inside the method, like we did here in update, and a variable that we put here. 
First of all, we can't make such a local variable private because no other script can go into this update method and access this variable. So this is basically private by default. But the difference is that we need dirx at the moment only inside update, nowhere else. Whereas rigid body has to be accessed from two different places, from start and from update. So we have to put it up here and make it a variable that is usable throughout this whole class. And that's good practice to ever create your variables in the smallest scope where you need it. So we could theoretically make dirx uh, a property up here, so a variable that we can use in this whole script, but it wouldn't be good practice at the moment because we don't need it anywhere else than inside update. So we create it in here with this float keyword. Now, of course, it would be nice if the camera actually followed along when we move our player, because right now, when we move around, we will eventually get out of the screen. Now, an easy way to handle this is to just take this camera and put it onto the player so it's nested below it. Now the camera will follow our player automatically. The positioning is not great yet, but it already works. And whenever we nest an object below another one, the position of this transform component is then relative to the parent object. So minus 2.05x of the camera is relative to the player. So when we set this to zero and y as well, it will be set directly on the player. Now, as I already mentioned for the camera, it's important that the Z value is minus 10 because it moves the camera a bit to the back. If we accidentally set this to zero here, the following will happen. We start our game and we suddenly only see a blue screen, even though it looks correct in the scene view. Why? Because the camera is now at the same Z position as the rest and it basically looks right through it behind what is behind our actual level. So we set this back to minus 10, the camera moves here, and this can happen very easily. So whenever it happens that you will see something here in the scene viewer, but it suddenly disappears when you click player, then make sure that the Z value is set correctly. It should be set to zero. So to see what I mean, let's set the Z value of terrain to minus 20. Here it looks completely normal, right? But in the 3D view, we can see that it actually moved behind the camera. And now when we start our game, we won't see the terrain. So always make sure to uh, check the Z value if something like this happens. One more little change I want to make in this video. When our player reaches the end of the terrain, it can fall over, right? And it flips when this happens. Now this looks really cool because the camera <laughs> flips over together with it. We will take care of this later. It's not meant to be like that. What we want to change right now is making the player not flip like this because it's not really appropriate for a 2D platformer game. So to change this, we click on player in the hierarchy. Then we go to rigid body 2D and here in constraints, we can freeze rotation Z. And now when we fall over, we will not flip in the Z direction anymore. And Z in rotation actually means something different than Z when it comes to the position. Z in the position was the depth, right? But when we change Z here in rotation, it moves it like this. So you can try this out by uh, changing these values up here. And you can drag like I just did by hovering with the mouse over the letter. And then you can see the cursor changes a little bit to this drag icon. Then you can hold and click and drag it around like this and always revert this with Control Z. I know what you're thinking, Florian, moving left and right is really cool and everything, but when can I start building the next League of Legends? And the answer is, not yet. We are not there yet, my young Palawan, you need a bit patience. But in the next video, we will already add animations to our player so it looks a lot cooler when it's moving around. So don't forget to subscribe to the channel and stay tuned for the next part. Take care.